Listener, and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, he, him, Chris, he, him, Tom, he, him, Joe, he, him, and an excitable Chris, he, him, excited. Shit. Damn it. <sighs> we'll keep, we'll it, keep it in, keep it in. Keeping it. We nailed He's it. Too we excited. nailed it, boys. Yep. This is your this is your punishment. <laughs> this is this is how you learn not to make those mistakes. Chris. This is the way I don't let my co-hosts introduce themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we we need to drill this lesson in. So we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. We're gonna go through, we're gonna finish the take, and then we're gonna redo the entire podcast as take two. And if any of you fuck it up, we'll be here for take three. But yeah, we have some guests back. We have some returning guests who are just now talking to the other co-hosts for the first time because we had Tom and Joe on previously to talk about the Soviet Death Star. However, we are now having them on to talk to everybody about a very dumb boat, a very fun, leaky boat that the Soviets built. I love a dumb boat. Yeah. I love that you, you know, crafted a wonderful script about, you know, space failures and immediately you brought on the chaos configuration. We talked about what if we gave Jesus a gun? (laughs) I can still work with that. I can still, we're going to talk about this very dumb boat being defended by men with the most incomprehensible weapon loadouts imaginable. Fuck yes. Whilst the boat is actively trying to kill them. That's the secret. The boat is always trying to kill you. Just sailors running around with uh, 16 Makarov pistols hanging off them. <laughs> like a pirate yeah, yeah, when they yeah, carry like, a like brace black powder things all, but if they're all semi-automatic pistols, like the guy from fucking Boondock Saints. <laughs> Wasn't there, I, I swear I remember, like, a World War I pilot who armed his, like, reconnaissance plane by bolting, like, 18 Lugers in, like, a semicircle and just had, like, had them what? all wired to the same trigger. Yeah, he was just doing that for the love of the game, though. <laughs> yeah, this is why they shouldn't let you, you know, customize your workstation or your uniform, or this is why we have standards and practices so <laughs> someone doesn't try and strap 18 Lugers to, you know, their podcast mic. I mean, what do you think I've been doing in the studio since everybody <laughs> left the Netherlands? This place has so many Luger strapped to it. <laughs> to be fair, I wish sometimes I had 16 Luger strapped to my microphone, but hey. He's making a, making a Rube Goldberg machine, except every single step in the Rube Goldberg machine is a Luger firing into the trigger of another Luger. <laughs> the, enti- the entire thing actions in half than a second, and you wind up with, like, maybe breakfast and maybe a gunshot wound. I, I was going to say that this sounds like an incredibly disappointing Rube Goldberg to, like, witness, because it's over immediately. <laughs> yeah, because you'll get <laughs> shot immediately. Except, <laughs> except you, can, you can use it ten times, or I don't know how many bullets a Luger has, you can use it a bunch of times before you have to fully rebuild it. I mean, the problem is, I don't think a Luger could absorb more than one Luger bullet before he can no Mm. longer fire it. See, the hardest part about arraying my Lugers was every time one of my bits falls flat, they actually all turn around and shoot me directly in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's the second most elaborate Rube Goldberg suicide after Yukio Mishima. (laughs) (laughs) Because why is trying to overthrow the Japanese government, reading out a speech, and then getting your boyfriend to cut your head off? than a Rube Goldberg suicide. We have achieved, like, I don't know how many minutes in, a couple of minutes in, every single box is ticked on the have the Lions hosts on as guests, like uh, Elden Ring discussion, maybe a music discussion can be worked in, and then, yeah, Yukio Mishima referenced in some way that is fun. You know, we used to have a saying that the CIA was their secret third co-host, but now that we have three co-hosts, Yukio Mishima has been promoted to be the fourth. Um, it happened against all of our wills. 
some guy at the CIA, like not anyone in power, not anyone who can actually coordinate stuff, just some guy who does listen to lines is like, oh, dang. In reality, the true uh, host configuration of lines is Joe is, of course, a solid snake. Um, Nate is Ocelot and I am Raiden. So, you know. Just it, just by default, giving yourself the twink roll. I... <laughs> hey, listen, shoe fits. I'm not saying I disagree. I'm just saying it's funny. Hey, what's the running joke? I'm built like bisexual Zangief, so. <clears throat> I, I think we, you could accuse us all of, of being many things. None of us qualify as a twink anymore. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm about 40 kilos past that. Nate's got a few years past the point of being a twink, and I, I never was one. <laughs> so, on our show, the secret fourth host is continually the Soviet space program or anything that Sergei Korolev ever got his hands on, especially whenever they are doing it for stupid political reasons that don't actually matter. And that is a lot of what we're going to talk about today, because we are going to talk about the SSV-33 Ural, the world's largest spy ship. So what you're saying is we are not going to talk about who of all of us would have the worst twink death. Mm. Going off of how I've aged so far, it would definitely be me. Well, okay, so twink death, I'm not fully familiar with the term. Does dying of hemorrhoid surgery count as twink no, death? No, 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 That's not the part that's, that's twink death. That's just actual death. That's just regular old death. Oh, the part oh, okay. that is I twink mean, like, death the... is when you're a twink, but then you kind of like grow up more, right? Okay. So you lose the twinkness. You get fat, hairy, and bald. That's just what it is. I was two of those things when I was 20. Joe, you just look like a hairy <laughs> drogger from Skyrim. Thank you. <laughs> I don't oh. know if that's a good thing. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> I'm not fat, I got that going for me. Hairy and balding, 100%. That would, be, that would be fun to just be playing Skyrim and just one of them just has really good hair, like a random drogger. That one would be me. That one's me. Okay, yeah, yeah. You've got the, yeah, the, the Italian Markiplier I think looks. that I think that it's a very, very fair thing to say that I have the most hair on my head of anyone in this room. I'm sorry. What's that like? I also think it's, uh, it is unfair of me to have referenced your facial features as just looking like Markiplier whenever we haven't done any kind of face reveal stuff. I have been... No, 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 this is perfect because I've, I, I'm sure I've brought this up before, but on more than one occasion. So, like, I know that this isn't, like, an isolated incident. Like, three servers at a Red Robin in Omaha, Nebraska, and then, like, the checkout clerk at this pet store that I go to here, both... We're like, you look like Dead Ringer to Markiplier. I'm like, they're like, you're like white Markiplier. And I'm like, oh, cool, thanks. And I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, man, I do look like a drogger. <laughs> hey, at least I'm lean, motherfucker. Thank you. I've been entombing myself got- every night. It's coming along great. And I'm going through the slow process of self-embalming. <laughs> While you've been um, training and grinding up your skills, Joe has been training. I've been lurking. Reducing the moisture content. <laughs> Too like moist. A ru- like a rug out sponge. <laughs> there he is. We're turning Joe into Biltong. <laughs> Fuck yes. Um, to answer the question, what is it like to have a deafening amount of hair on your head? It's very warm in the summer. <laughs> See, I get that problem everywhere else because of genetics. I get my hair cut like once a year and I get it cut back to nothing because then the, the maximum centimeters per dollar is achieved. Mm-hmm. And then you get to harvest all that sweet succulent hair. <laughs> Stuff it into your well, no, pillow. That's what, you never have to that's buy what a goes into again. the space pillows. Yeah. yeah. Would you like a sweater? It's woven from my hair. <laughs> it's like we that said is... in the studio in uh, the Netherlands is that the uh, one Armenian that they sent to space suffered the uh, ultimate god's gambit and that he lost all his hair. Oh no. <laughs> Armenians aren't meant to go to space. The fate of all Armenian mid once they hit the ripe old age of 26. <laughs> Nationally obligated twink death. <laughs> every, every single Armenian man. Um, also, audience, if you do want to hear more of uh, dumb shit like this, consider supporting us on Patreon. You can get access to uh, bonus movies, um, as well as some fun minisodes talking about other space disaster topics. Soviet space tracking ships. So, this show, we mostly talk about spaceships. 
today we're but we have diverged a little bit. We've already talking about balloons. So why not just go all out, abandon having to talk about things in space? We're going to talk about a boat. We're going to talk about a very large boat that the Soviets built and was a colossal failure to the point that it never really put to sea. Why is that such a trend for the Soviet Union when it comes to big boats? <laughs> now, one of the least explored parts of the Soviet space program is the shadowy fleet of ships that were deployed around the world to support their rockets and spacecraft. Um, now, it's pretty uncontroversial to say that communications and tracking is very important to a space program, you know, because anything in space is at least 100 kilometers away from you and moving so quickly that any one radio link isn't going to last very long. Like a shooting star will fly across the sky and it's already, you know, within a minute or two, it is out of your radio's range. So what space programs do is they have tracking stations, at least back then. Like nowadays, you can track satellites with other satellites. We have a communication net up. But back then, in the early space race, the idea was just put as many tracking stations as possible in your own country, in allied countries. And if you're the Soviet Union and you don't have a lot of international widespread allies, uh, just put them on a bunch of boats and just park those boats in the middle of the ocean and just let them sit there and occasionally get a transmission. Yeah, it's just like it's the age old Soviet program of let's spend a lot of money doing this thing that we rarely use that we will slowly let fall apart. Yes. Now, NASA solved this problem by leveraging U.S. allies all around the world. So they had satellite tracking stations as far away as Australia, and they were all kind of like networked together so that Houston could get a good idea of what a satellite was doing, even if it was on like the opposite side of the world. As an added benefit, satellite tracking stations are also incredible for spying, because if you can monitor your satellites, you can also snoop on enemy satellites and missile tests. So, for example, for most of the Cold War, anything that took off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, like any Soviet rocket, uh, was being consistently pinged by radar sites in Iran and Japan. The U.S. had the Soviet space program pretty well boxed in with, like, these listening stations all around. It just got me thinking, like, the only thing more miserable than being in Baikonur back then has to have been, like, being a CIA guy in Iran listening to nothing but Soviet soldiers complain about how much Baikonur sucks. <laughs> it had to be kind of funny at first, then you just had to start feeling sorry for him. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they had some kind of like parasocial relationship going on with like, don't worry, it also sucks here, friend. Wait, are you saying that the CIA listening stations were the first content creators? <laughs> yes. <laughs> just pa cutting together a podcast of just Soviet soldiers complaining about how much Kazakhstan sucks. Forwarding to the rest of the nation how the camel spider fights are going. Doing fantasy football, but for the camel spider fights. <laughs> now, the Soviets did not really have that luxury. Uh, from the book The Soviet Challenge to Apollo, quote, Although the Soviet Union stretched close to two and a half times more in width than the contiguous United States, there were clear limitations to monitoring space missions from a single landmass, especially given the heightened requirements of a piloted mission. Perhaps reluctant to negotiate treaties as NASA did to station tracking points on foreign soil, the Soviets instead resorted to fully equipped, self-contained naval vessels stationed all around the world. And that is a bit of a flowery way of saying it. These ships were not, they were not uh, fully equipped or self-contained. <laughs> Now, the earliest space tracking ships were just modified cargo ships that the Soviet uh, Navy had lying around, and the Soviet space program didn't even really have the clout to just requisition them. They had to rent them from the Ministry of the Merchant Fleet. <laughs> they had to rent them from themselves? <laughs> yeah, get yes. ruined. Yeah, because this is still, like, very early in the space race. Like, it's becoming important to the Soviets. They kind of have, like, Khrushchev can just, he can open up a lot of doors for them. Uh, but they go to the Ministry of the Merchant Fleet and like, hey, can we have ships? No, you can fucking give us some of that money that Khrushchev is giving you. It's just one hand moving po money from one pocket to the other. Get out of here, space boy. This is sea land. <laughs> There's something that completely baffles me about the concept of the Soviets renting, you know? Well, yeah. Didn't they have didn't they have the big old the big old party about that, you know? People I mean, isn't were the Soviet government like the ultimate landlord in in a way? <laughs> <laughs> what is communism except capitalism? <laughs> so they wind up with four rented ships, the Krasnodar, the Voroshilov, the Dolinsk, and the Aksai. And when I say that these first ships were just modified to track satellites, I really mean that the Soviets just like 
took the flat tops of these cargo ships and just bolted small forests of radars, transmitters, and receivers just right onto the ship's deck. Hell yeah. And were, were they running on Mazout? Yes or no? Uh, these ones probably would have been, yeah. I'm sure Hell they yes. did this without doing any form of stability calculation after oh, no, having these, completely these shifted the it. center of gravity. <laughs> no, who needs to know about that antenna that's going to be stories above your ship don't worry about it yeah just like yeah. one of them accidentally gets knocked around in a storm and it's beaming 5g directly into the bridge 24 7 <laughs> getting like a new form of like testicular cancer from the satellites <laughs> pointing directly at your balls <laughs> the satellite has microwaved all my dna i'm sorry boys we we are trying to make new soviet markiplier it does not work <laughs> but we can track satellites M not when we expect it but we will accept we have uh, we have run out of space on deck, so you will have to bunk with antenna now. It is in your room. <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting on the top bunk, and in the bottom bunk is like a transmitter beaming straight through you, the in like right through the middle of your chest. <laughs> we we must uh, make the most of the space that we have, so you'll understand that your bed is always nice and warm. We were uh, conducting experiment to see if we could create. Soviet little boy with four arms like Goro from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> with four arms, he can salute four times at once. Sailor misses roll call, they go down to his bunk and he's just a shriveled husk. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the baby from Eraserhead. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, some of these ships actually have some pretty interesting stories. Um, so before it was the Varashilov, one of those ships was the Brazilian Prince. And this is also just how, like, Cargo ships just kind of change hands all the time and always have. The Krasnodar, for example, was a Nazi supply ship, uh, the Pernambuco. Before it was captured by the British in World War II, it was renamed the Empire Dart, and then they sold it to the Soviets in 1946. So that's like, I guess, like a mini paperclip kind of thing. Like, they're getting some help from the Nazis in a roundabout way. I mean, that should be the way you get help from the Nazis, is that you end up stealing their shit. You just yeah. repos yeah, you repossess <laughs> all of their shit. The, the, you'll notice in our Operation Paperclip, clip, I'm wearing these German versions of Air Force Ones. <laughs> now you're probably wondering where I got these. My God, he got on the old black uh, Air Force Ones. We must run away before he gets up to some Air Force One activity. <laughs> <laughs> these are way too big to be spy ships. Well, these, these things are, they have the kind of dual use of, they are spy ships, but they have the cover story of, oh, no, 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 we're just here to help the man space flight. Yeah, we're, we're just, the, don't mind us, we're just toting around these two gigantic geodesic domes. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it, we're blasting enough radiation to kill off all fish within a one mile radius. <laughs> oh, hold that thought, hold that thought! <laughs> we're just a friendly local uh, transport ship and we're transporting cancer. <laughs> all we're doing is just, we are smuggling large amounts of cigarettes across the Aegean Sea to Greece. Don't mind anything. That boat is carrying so many cigarettes, and any time a seagull flies over those antennas, it just bursts into flames. <laughs> I see you like your skin. Would you prefer it fell off your bones? Let us just slowly drive this inconspicuous craft near Would you. Would you like the skin to fall off your bones like a, a slow roasted piece of chicken, or how would you like the new experimental skin on the inside? I'm looking at the picture now, and I'm seeing that there is, like, you can stand on the mast um, the kind of middle mass, there's a platform there immediately below one of the antennas. <laughs> Guys are oh. probably just up there. It's just like, we call this instant tanning. You go up there for five seconds, you come back down. <laughs> Two guys both called Igor and Igor doing like the Titanic, you know, my heart will go on thing just below the radar <laughs> antenna. And they're slowly more melding into one person. <laughs> <laughs> they fuse together at the cellular level. Oh no, we've, we've created Soviet Majin Buu. <laughs> we, have, we have created the ultimate conscript, the most powerful conscript the world has ever seen. Zero to the master from Fallout in five seconds. <laughs> Soviet Gogeta. So these early ships were enough for the first few Soviet manned launches. Posted up in the Pacific and Atlantic at the right points, they acted as little islands of contact while Yuri Gagarin and the other first cosmonauts drifted through space. As the 60s rolled on and the space race started heating up, they were joined by two more modified ships, the Ristna and the Bajitsa. But the slapdash, let's put antennas on a cargo ship idea was, was, it was starting to show its age by this time, and the Soviets knew they needed a custom solution. Also, they wanted to own ships instead of renting them, which I can understand. And then it called up Tim Westwood. 
<laughs> <laughs> Westwood, baby! I got a call from Nikita Khrushchev. He wants to pimp his ships. <laughs> oh, God. So they start kind of standardizing ships. Starting in 1966, they built four unfinished lumber carriers and turned them into the Selena class of dedicated space tracking ships. Uh, so these are the Borovici, the Neville, the Morjovets, and the Kogostrov. And they become known as the Small Space Fleet. That is their official designation. All of these modified cargo ships and lumber ships. And this necessarily implies the existence of the large space fleet, which started taking shape in 1967. How could it get larger? Oh, it gets big. The first of these is the cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. So they like to name their ships after cosmonauts or space figures who have died in the kind of line of duty. Um, so Vladimir Komarov, this is named after the cosmonaut who died in the Soyuz 1 crash. It also started life as a cargo ship before getting completely overhauled into a massive floating mission control. Uh, so you can see it's got like the two massive radomes there. This one is not just a communications relay. Like they can fully do mission control inside of that boat. They put tits on a ship. <laughs> yeah, you've teased us the same way that Komarov is teasing us with its big naturals. <laughs> how much would it suck to be assigned to floating mission control? Like, how long are they out there for? Oh, hold that thought. It's oh mission God. control, but you have the perk of vomiting onto your console thanks to seasickness. Hell yes. So this was followed by the academic Sergei Korolev, and this, this one was finally the first purpose-built Soviet tracking ship. It was modified from a cargo ship. And then this was followed by the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. And this is probably the most famous one. You can see that the, the, um, the Yuri Gagarin just has four massive radomes just mounted on top of basically a cruise ship. It looks like it's ready to fire at something. It looks like a, uh, like a doomsday weapon in a pulp sci-fi book it's, uh, written in the 50s. This is just a level from Metal Gear Solid Bourne. <laughs> Like, this shit is at, parked outside Shadow Moses. And if anyone comes up to interfere, yeah, like, you would be trying to infiltrate onto this thing, and the radome turns to point at you. And it just fires, like, this microwave beam. Yeah, yeah. they hit you with the 6G cancer gun. They hit you <laughs> with the particle accelerator that went right through that Soviet dude's head. The inside, your insides become your outsides rapidly. Yeah, it's, it's like that uh, Treehouse of Horror bit from The Simpsons. Oh, yeah, they all turn inside out. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. the fog. We've pivoted perfectly into turning this vessel into something from Red Alert instead. <laughs> Looks like yeah. it's firing a Godzilla beam out of something. I like it better our way, to be completely honest. So, because the contact times could be very short, and these ships couldn't really relay messages right back to Moscow, every ship had to be able to solve any problems by itself. Which means they needed hands-on experts, uh, they needed envoys from every military and civilian space project, and they needed their own capsule communicators or CAPCOMs. Quote, Each ship had a cosmonaut engineer to communicate with a spacecraft. For example, Yuri Artyukin was on board cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov, and Anatoly Kuklin was on academician Sergei Korolev. In addition, for the Soyuz 10 mission, there were experts from uh, the TSKBEM familiar with the design of the DOS docking system to provide advice necessary. So that's a kind of flowery way of saying, if you are a cosmonaut, it is entirely possible for you to spend a couple of years posted on the floating mission control in the middle of the Atlantic. It's like a punishment. It's better than getting sentenced to Baikonur. <laughs> yeah, what do you choose? If, you, if you're a Soviet cosmonaut and you're clearly not going to space, like, do, you, do you choose to be stationed at Baikonur or do you choose the floating radiation death tomb? Like, which one Don't is worry, it? we wanted you to feel at home, so we introduced camel spiders onto the ship. <laughs> would you prefer damp hell or dry hell <laughs> we heard we heard that you longed for a career of being packed in confined dangerous spaces so we put you on this thing because we can't put you in space yep quint yeah i'm thinking about how it's like a a disconnected like kremlin would be like okay what can we do to make these guys <laughs> what, can we, what can we do to make these guys feel at home on the ship? I don't know. Just bring, bring some <laughs> sand in the camel spiders or something. I think they like those. <laughs> There's just a little sandbox room that just looks like Baikonur. Yeah, like, even they bring radioactive isotopes explicitly to give you the weird disease. The Baikonur guys are so desperate, are so desperate to escape Baikonur. But then it's like, they're like, oh, I'll do anything. So I'll go on this ship in the middle of the ocean for months at a time. And it's like, 
boom, more spiders. They get there and they brought and then and the Kremlin has brought Baikonur with them. So the Kremlin basically thinks that all of these guys are like chinchillas and they just need to do like (coughs) dust baths constantly. They, they, they've actually lied to them and instead of the cosmonauts are, you know, maintaining communications with satellites, they're actually using the radiation from the communication relays to <laughs> mutate the camel spiders. So they're making super camel spiders. They're trying to make Quaylag. Oh no, gentlemen, the spiders have broken containment. <laughs> we're, cre- we're creating the floating version of Lost Isola. This is just reminding me of that, uh, that shitty movie, uh, Virus. Oh yeah which takes place on a Soviet space tracking ship very similar um, to the one we're going to talk about. Have you ever wanted a camel spider that can speak? What happens oh, if they great. start learning how to control the boat? Mm. Then, then you give them the spiders a navy. Spider shock Soviet navy by ordering food in perfect Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, a Soviet navy crewed entirely by mutant spiders would be better than the regular Soviet navy. Well, yeah, more arms, more, more fish. I was, I was trying to workshop how we could, we could title that where we're combining mutant and mutiny. <laughs> the Don't mutant worry, team. they have more arms so they can abuse more subordinates at once. We could <laughs> haze you so much better now because we have so many more arms. Doing, yeah, doing Dedovshina. The rule of the grand spiders. Getting drummed into the crew of the, uh, the, uh, the USS <laughs> dead cosmonaut by a bunch of camel spiders. And it's like Donashina is like the you know the rule of the grandfathers, but now it's the rule of the grand spiders. <laughs> oh no! You know that is it JoJo's part three or four when they get on the ship and it's being piloted purely by a sentient orangutan. That's yes, sick. I've now been left behind. The actual stand is the ship, so we just we're a couple of steps away from this. <laughs> Startlingly close. Through the 70s and 80s, some of the older ships of the small space fleet were replaced with newer models, and the total number of active Soviet tracking ships would hover somewhere between 7 and 10. In the final years of the Soviet Union, two more large ships were built. The Marshal Nadelin, named after the idiot responsible for the worst disaster in space history, and the Marshal Krylov. Well, at least Nadelin, you know, went down with his ship, per se. (laughs) And spectacularly, may I add. Just getting absolutely obliterated by a rocket while you're just big chilling in a lawn chair. The figure, yeah, the figure on the front of the ship where it would normally be like a mermaid or something is just a fat dude sitting on a lawn chair. Don't talk about Doug Hagdahl like that. <laughs> <laughs> it seems bad luck to um, name your ship after people who die from like incredible incompetence and fi- and then, you know, not to mention Gagarin's in it. Like, he's still yeah. alive. Well, I mean, Gagarin is dead by this point. Good. Yeah, like these are these are exclusively named after dead guys. But yeah, they're they're sometimes named after like dead cosmonauts who died in the line of duty, and they're sometimes named after the guy who uh, murdered a good chunk of the Soviet space program. I it, it was like something we always made a joke about when I was in the army because every base and every uh, every building and every army base in a war zone or not in a war zone is always named after a dead guy. So it's like, you know, if you die, they're going to name, like, the shitter after you. <laughs> and, it, like, you know, you gave your life for the Soviet Union, probably because, specifically, of a Soviet fuck-up. Like, we're going to name the world's most miserable ship after you in, in your <laughs> honor. Straight jerking it into Korolev Portaloo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the radiation on the Sergei Korolev giving everyone hemorrhoids, giving everyone his pain. You know, when you when you stay on the Korolev long enough and get doses of so much radiation, they get what the, what's called Korolev disease, and that's what your balls and your dick exchange places. And- I'm thinking of like all the 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 specters of the the Soviet space program as like the Cobras unit, and so like yeah, so so <laughs> Korolev could be the pain, and the pain is hemorrhoids, just inflicting hemorrhoids on someone through eyesight. <laughs> Pulling out the hemorrhoids ray gun and just pointing it straight at someone's ass. <laughs> it's such a specific kind of hazing. We have to give you hemorrhoids so you fit in around here. <laughs> you will not have comfortable shit during your deployment. We all know that the CIA has the heart attack gun, the KGB has the hemorrhoid gun. Or, or they have just like the, the BBL gun that just gives you two massive cheeks and it makes it very hard to navigate <laughs> the ship because the corridors are so narrow. The spacesuit just bursting mid EVA. <laughs> we ha- we have sentenced you, comrade, to being, as they say, in the decadent West, being caked up. <laughs> w- 
Now, when the Soviet Union broke apart, most of these space tracking ships were left with no funding and no real space program to support. Today, every single one of them save two has been sold for scrap. So the cosmonaut Viktor Patsayev, named after one of the guys who died on Soyuz 11, is now a museum piece. And the Marshall Krylov is, it was refitted. It's technically still in service with the Russian Navy. Um, although it doesn't do any kind of space tracking, it's exclusively used for their missile program. So that's all of these ships. Like for a while, there's this big Soviet fleet of tracking ships, and then they all kind of, they die with the Soviet Union pretty much. God, were any of them sold as part of the Pepsi deal? Because that'd be fucking hilarious. Or to get sold to Victor Boot. <laughs> no, if it was a plane, Victor Boot would be all over it. He didn't fuck with the sea. He knew better. What Victor Boot and Neptune had an alliance. He could have taken the death ray off the top of one, mounted it to like some old Antonov plane. He would have mounted the death, death ray on like a Toyota Tacoma and sold it to Charles Taylor. <laughs> oh, God. That is the story of the civilian tracking ships that supported the Soviet space program. But there was one more, and it was much bigger, nuclear powered, and just a little leaky. The SSV-33 Ural. And I should preface that it leaked radiation and water equally. Spicy water. We're getting the mutant spiders, the sailors with big balls and big asses. Like <laughs> we're, we're essentially creating the either David Cronenberg or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The Soviet Union created their own seaborn like soda stream, right? Like you put in regular water and fizzy water comes out. <laughs> This ship, as soon as they put it into water, like the heat coming off the reactors, this ship has never touched water. It swims exclusively through fish soup. It's just in the laden frost effect the entire time. <laughs> the world's largest spy ship. Like we talked about before, the space tracking ships had a double duty that made them very attractive to the Soviet Navy. On top of monitoring Soviet space launches, they could also track and spy on American launch sites, either for NASA missions or nuclear missile tests. This was easy enough in the Atlantic since American rockets flew out of Cape Canaveral, where listening posts in Cuba and on tracking ships watching like Soviet space stations, there was a lot of infrastructure there to spy on Cape Canaveral. For the Pacific, where American intercontinental ballistic missiles dropped into test ranges and onto um, sparsely occupied islands of people who have uh, never gotten any kind of compensation for this. That sounds like it could never happen. Huh. We would certainly not be living with the repercussions of this action to this day. Of course not. So, for the Pacific, it's another story. The Soviets didn't have many allies in the region, which meant they couldn't just build listening posts or put their tracking ships into friendly ports. So even as big as these ships are, they are not meant to be, like, sitting in the middle of the Pacific, nowhere near port, for months on end. And while the ships of the space fleet could pull double duty as spies, they still needed cover stories. So if you park a tracking ship in the middle of the ocean, nowhere near any of your space stations, the Americans might wonder like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? That is not a very inconspicuous ship that you have floating there. <laughs> yeah, why is there a big floating Chernobyl here? It's the mobile Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> the mobile Chernobyl. <laughs> Sticker idea. Shout out to the political officer who had to, like, sit the ship down and get it to memorize its cover story. <laughs> what are they going to do? Beat the steering wheel until it agrees? Someone on, like, an American eye, like, at, at one of these missile testing sites, like, yeah, we found a spider and it was wearing eye patches and it had a knife. Um, I blame the schools. I want to know how they're going to put a mustache on it. <laughs> do you put it on the radome? A spider with the giant, um, like, Sam Fisher NVGs. I'm thinking of the most, like, unexciting uh, original television show, like The Americans, but it's just a ship where the Soviet Union is like, we've built this ship in the United States. They'll never know. It was a spy ship. Like, yeah, that's canceled after three episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody fucking cares. Or it ran for, like, six seasons. The side story is about how the ship just occasionally eats someone. And that ship is fucking like mad, just like in the show. Everybody in that show is fun. like that boat. That boat is just acting as a honeypot for Norwegian cruise lines. <laughs> <laughs> it had been reassigned. It was originally commissioned in France, but it found that obviously they didn't. None of the French agents really cared about their extramarital affairs being told to their wife. So the Soviets want to be able to spy on these Pacific um, missile test sites, and to do this job properly, they would need a dedicated space spying vessel. And the project creep started immediately. So all of this 
kind of cycle. It's a vicious cycle that just makes the ship more expensive and bigger. Since the Americans weren't announcing all their top secret missile tests ahead of time, the ship would need to be big enough to loiter in the sea for like an extended period of time. It had to be able to keep itself going with like crew, supplies, fuel, all of that. But if it was going to be big, it would be easy to spot. So it needed to have massive sensors so that it could spy on the Americans from like really far away, far enough that the Americans weren't able to see it. So it only grows larger. Yeah, big sensors means a lot of crew and systems to maintain them, which drives up the size even more. The design quickly got so big that the Soviets decided to repurpose an entire unfinished hull for a Kirov nuclear battle cruiser. My god. This is the largest combat ship currently in service today. It is almost as big as an aircraft carrier, and the Navy is about to get like a fifth of these, and the space program kind of barges in like, uh, no, I need this, please. I need to borrow one for something really stupid. <laughs> Don't ask me about it, I'll explain it later. It still wasn't big enough. The Soviets had to widen the hull, and they even had to, like, the dry dock that they were building this thing in, they had to make special doors that were, like, bowed out to just to fit the end of this ship. So they had to make the ship thicker. Yeah. Yeah, they got thick ship, but, like, all of the OKBs of the Soviet space program are just the orcs from Warhammer. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we'll slap it together, it will work. We won't we, We'll fully understand how it works or why it's working, but it'll do its job. I wonder if the naval OKBs had the same thing that the space OKBs have, where they just got into low-level gang wars constantly. The Soviet people's DACA. <laughs> yeah, just like <laughs> you're chatting with your rival, you're standing next to the open reactor pit, and when no one's looking, you just shove them in. I mean, this ship requires flesh. It's how it fixes itself. This design just got bigger and bigger and bigger. To the point that, like, they pile an entire city's worth of infrastructure on top of this already extended hull. When finished, it would have a crew of over a thousand. And just to, like, try and keep people happy through these months-long missions, they had a swimming pool, a movie theater, and some saunas. Which I imagine are just, like, the rooms immediately next to the reactor. <laughs> I'm gonna go get a schwitz, and you, like, use the little, like, reeds that the Russians use, and then, the, but, like... Every just time like they slap slapping them, someone's the skin of the comes reactor. off. Just slap <laughs> your oh, back with the birch branches and a little bit skin just sloughs off. I like the idea that, that, that all of these amenities are right next to the reactor, not just because of the reactor heat, but also because they'd have to just put less wiring in because the power source is right there. Well, yeah, but it's like a, it's absolutely not safe and it's absolutely not comfortable. And so it's like, I don't know, why'd you guys do it that way? It it's because cheaper. the design of the sauna is very human, obviously. The reactor is multifunctional. Soviet soldiers have just created a banya in around the fucking reactor. <laughs> There's just loads of them hitting each other with, like, birch branches. This, the pool is also a hot tub. Missing the entire uh, American missile launch because Private Yevgeny had the one, re uh, the one outlet out of the reactor plugged into the sauna instead of the radar. <laughs> <laughs> this ship got so big that the Kirov's original nuclear reactor power plant wasn't big enough to keep the Ural moving or feed the massive radar bolted on its roof at the same time. How the fuck did they do that? That is, I was going to say, this is the one thing that pisses me off the most about this vessel. How have you used that much power? <laughs> so they had to replace it with two nuclear reactors taken off of a Soviet icebreaker. Even then, those reactors were not enough needs more reactors it, they, they couldn't put more reactors in just by like size so what they had to do was they had to supercharge the reactors by feeding them nuclear fuel enriched past 90 percent so any fans who remember the cosmos 954 series will know that that is literally weapons grade fuel like normally mm -hmm. a nuclear ship will run with like 25 percent enriched in, enriched uranium something like that like no they are literally taking uranium that is coming off of the line for Soviet nuclear weapons and just piling it into these reactors. Yeah, because it has the nutrients that the ship craves. They've supercharged two nuclear reactors, and everyone is going to be surprised when this fails in a little bit. They've made an engine that runs off bombs. Yeah, similarly how I run my car off, you know, napalm. Yes, it is explosive and a weapon, but does it make the car go faster? Yeah, that's the important part. Also, because this was technically a ship of the Soviet Navy, it needed weapons. So it had two 76mm turrets at the front and back, four close-in weapon systems, and four surface-to-air missile mounts, which admittedly for a ship this big is not a lot. It's mostly just like self-defense stuff. 
Why does it even need weapons? Just point the ship at whatever's threatening it. <laughs> yeah, just point the radar at something and watch it melt. Quinn, I'm stuck on the power supply here because it's like yeah. two nuclear reactors now. No, it started with two and then they got bigger. Yeah, so they, they originally were going to use, because they're using the, part, the partially finished hull of a Kirov-class cruiser, they were going to use its reactors, but they realized that that wouldn't be able to power the radar and the ship at the same time. So they had to take, uh, I believe it's a one-reactor design. It's a singular design that uses two reactors. It's not two completely you separate do, reactors. You do need some redundancy, but also, how do you just fuck up that much power consumption? Have they never heard of a guy called Nicholas Christophilos? The size of the radar. That is how you consume that much power. God, this thing looks terrible. <laughs> it's dissolving. It looks like if the, boy, if the radioactive Boy Scout built a ship. Oh, the David Hahn special? <laughs> yeah. As this thing is getting designed and built, it would eventually gain the name Ural. But I want you to keep this in mind. This is a spy ship. It was given the project name Titan. And it was an aircraft carrier-sized, nuclear-powered spy ship. Also, whenever she put to sea, she was given the NATO reporting name Capusta, which means cabbage. I don't know whether that's a good thing or bad thing. Maybe it smelled bad. It's just a, that's what this smell of uh, loads of sailors being turned into chemical effluent smells like. Was it maybe called cabbage because the radomes look like a cabbage? Oh yeah, Probably. that is very Probably. possible. Entirely possible. The, the SSV Vladimir Komarov getting the NATO reporting name Big Naturals. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, work on the Ural started in 1981 in the Leningrad shipyards, and her hull was finished in 1983. The next several years were a nightmare of fitting that hull with the most advanced and finicky technology the Soviets had ever built. For example, controlling and processing data off the ship's massive radar meant cramming entire decks full of Soviet supercomputers. Quote, It's seven powerful constituent radioelectronic systems and a number of ES-1046 and Elbrus supercomputers were designed to track missiles, determine the type of rocket, range and launch site and target coordinates, payload weight and telemetric data, even down to the chemical composition of the rocket fuel used. Like, these systems are very effective. They are very cool. They are, for the, the time, like, the cutting edge of intelligence gathering. They are also incredibly finicky. They do not like being near sea spray, and they consume, like, if you turn these on, you can't run the ship anymore. They would have saved so much money if they got, like, 12 Uzbek guys who were really good at maths to do instead. <laughs> turn on the computers and the entire deck just immediately just goes due to heat You just stroke. hear like the deafening roar of a thousand slide rules clacking along. I like the idea that they've built a ship for spying that is A, full of things that hate being near the water, and B, so powerful that it kills a nuclear engine, like a nuclear reactor. Also, it is not secret. As soon as this thing is getting built, NATO is just like, oh, that's a spy ship. It's huge. We're yeah, going to call it cabbage. Huge. And it has a giant dome on top of it. Yeah, we can't miss the big natural ship. <laughs> so all of these systems, they actually weren't ready when the ship first sailed. The Soviets, like, they got it to the point where it could move under its own power, and then they just decided they would fix it along the way. Never a good idea. We are taking boxes right now for real Soviet energy. While the massive Kirov-class ships she was derived from, they had actually kept their design relatively simple because they only used, like, off-the-shelf weapons and sensors Practically everything on the Ural was custom built, which made the design incredibly complicated and hard to maintain. Like, the only people who can maintain this ship are the guys who designed every different system on it. Like, you designed the radar, guess what? You're going on the ship because you're the only guy who knows how it works. You live here now. Yeah, <laughs> you get to stay in the dome. It's like the difference between, like, American and Soviet kind of developmental a doctrine when it comes to like developing weapons or information systems is like the Soviets are we took these like 4,000 scientists sent them to Siberia for years to research how to make the perfect <laughs> sphere we named it after a guy who was probably executed by the NKVD whereas the US is like we've got 4,000 Nazi scientists and we called it the USS Big Naturals I love the idea that it is like just so conspicuous like, it's, yeah. it's huge, and I'm imagining now, because it feeds on flesh, it feeds on bombs, 
at like when they flip this thing on and the sensors start going and everything else on the ship turns off because it's taking all the power it's screaming on every spectrum like you Once can again. hear it with your ears it's deafening it's mobile chernobyl it is it is but i just I, I love the idea that it's like the crew is literally deaf and like they're like bleeding from their ears and eyes and nose and it's like it is simultaneously both like a natural screaming but also like immaterial screaming tearing the sound of souls being torn apart to fuel this infernal device and it's just like yeah it's a it's a good spy ship they'll never find us and it's, it's like, like if it's like a chaos from warhammer 40k or it's like be the closest you can ever be to actually going on a voyage on the event horizon no hold up joe <laughs> are you saying this is what it's like to be on a void ship when the gellerfield goes <laughs> it fucking sounds like it like oh everybody's flesh is being swallowed by the steel it's fine this is just like they have discovered a form of spectral sonar. The screaming of the damned flies off into space and some of it is reflected back to the ship where the technomancers of the Soviet Navy are able to interpret it. Is it the Uzbek guys with calculators? Yes. Okay. Yeah, except, except they have like had those calculators inserted into their frontal lobes so they can properly so and they're rationally... So the now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to say, are Uzbeks canonically the Mechanicus? <laughs> <laughs> the moon is canonically Turkish. That means Mars is canonically Uzbek. It checks out. It's science. So training on this ship was also a nightmare. Surprise! Who would have shocker? Thought? <laughs> Part of that is because of how complex the ship was, but the other is because out of a crew of around a thousand, only like a couple hundred of these guys are actual enlisted men who could maintain and work on the ship. Seventy percent of this crew is officers and scientists. Oh my god. It means that for a ship this size, like, the enlisted dudes who have to maintain it are, like, sprinting back and forth, like, several hundred meters to fix the, anything on this ship that is constantly breaking. Jesus. And that's very hard to do when your bones are literally being turned to jelly from being inside. Like, oh, you know, we lost another sailor because his shin exploded as he was running over to do his sixth shift in a row or whatever. Goddamn. The guy who was supposed to close that valve just looks like when Zoidberg took off his shell. <laughs> oh. And then, in 1987, while the ship was still being tested and kitted out in the middle of Leningrad, the engineers discovered another problem. Her reactors were leaking a, quote, unacceptable amount of radiation. What is an acceptable amount? Which implies that there is an acceptable amount of radiation to the Soviet Navy and that that number was not zero. Mm -hmm. Which is, I assume, leaking out into the ship itself. Yes, and into the crew, because, like, as this is going on, like, um, for a ship, there are several years of, like, fitting out work. So in some parts of the ship, the crew will be training on how to run the ship. On other parts of the ship, like, there will be a maintenance crew putting this system in or that system in. Like, the hull is built, the reactor is in place, and it is just leaching weapons-grade radioactive dust into these men. Yeah, it's, it's the nuclear version of rolling coal. I love how, like, every photo of this thing, it's just rusting apart. It makes a lot of it make more sense when it, it looks like it's falling apart in every photo, and you know every corridor of that thing is spicy as fuck. Oh, it's also, uh, people describe it as being a huge maze inside to the point that, like, only the guy who designed it was reliably able to navigate the labyrinth. They made a nuclear fucking maze? Yes, <laughs> and, they, and they made it float. <laughs> Quinn, I have to ask, is this an example of another Soviet mega project that outlives the Soviet Union before it actually works? Okay. It does outlive the Soviet Union, but it's, it's, kind, it's, of a it's kind of a zombie in doing so. I just had a thought of that. It's a maze, but like, what if it was like the cube and the rooms were constantly <laughs> rearranging? Every room murders a <laughs> sailor in a different way. <laughs> the dome is in control of everything. It's gained sentience. It's fucking with the crew. I forgot that Canadians <laughs> just instinctively have a immediate reference to the film Cube and Cube 2. Well, they're, they're American. I'm, I'm the Canadian on the show. <laughs> But the, I'm pretty sure it's because we watched Q we watched like two weeks Q, ago. Like two weeks ago. I'm sure, I'm sure in this scenario, in the cube scenario, every scientist, like all of the Soviet rocket scientists on board would just be like, 
well, of course, that's the laser room. Of course, it, like they the, to them, yeah. it is perfectly normal. And just this crew of 200 or so enlisted men are just getting like mulched every day. Getting lost and you have to send like rescue parties like, oh, so and so hasn't reported to like the chow hall yet. And like, I'll go find him as you're walking. The hallways are shifting around you. You're finding people who've been lost for years. You <laughs> accidentally enter the tiger room. You Sorry, find guys, actually in in the lost in the razor blade room for some reason. <laughs> Who put this in here? I was going to say you finally find your guy and he's just half melted into the wall. The ship is eating him. He's a ship centaur now. Having to ask um, radar crew the uh, the name of the 20 man melded flesh beast that mans the uh, the tracking station for directions. And it just what screams. Beat me to it. You just have a navigator <laughs> from Dune up there. What what if uh, a rat? What if humans could accidentally do the Rat King thing, but it's oh like God. their bones have molded together? See, I made the mistake of saying Event Horizon. No, this is the USG Ishimura from Dead Space. Fuck! Oh Jesus Christ! It is doing uh, the Dune Navigator thing, except the dust that you snort is yellow cake. <laughs> Some fresh, uncut yellow flake. <laughs> you do a fat line and your skull just melts through your asshole. Key bumps of yellow cake. Just passing it around. Anyone want some? Chopping it up with your fucking issue <laughs> ID card. <laughs> this is the only way we can navigate. So the reactor is leaking a, quote, unacceptable amount into the crew. Fellas, you ever feel like your bones bend kind of funny sometimes after being on the ship? You think your bones are a bit too it soft? Is, uh, not, your injuries are uh, not service related. <laughs> oh god, I can only imagine what the Soviet Department of Veterans Affairs looks like. This, uh, this ship is just a very elaborate ploy to come up with a new base stock for soup. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> we're making the forbidden borscht here, boys. <laughs> so, they need to get this reactor out, and the problem is, they have discovered this, like, it's not just the hull anymore, they have built an entire city's worth of infrastructure on top. They cannot just lift the reactor out of there. Yeah, you can. Don't Wait, be they about built it. it inside. They built around it and have yes. had no way yeah. to actually service it. So they had to cut a huge hole in the side of the hull and take the reactor out. Oh, that good. Way. That's how you get the. That's how you get the radiation out. You gotta. You gotta bore a hole into it. They're medieval doing medieval fucking balancing the humors. They're putting leeches on the uh -huh. boat to leech out the fucking radiation. I, I, I love the idea that the reactor was like just boxed in. It's like we have trapped the demon within a lead shell and it cannot escape. <laughs> they have like a Soviet nuclear priest like keeping it at like, uh, like, uh, like <laughs> I've had to calm the ship's spirit. Yeah, we have to <laughs> sacrifice soldiers like psychers to the emperor. The reason the radome is fucked up is because they trepanned it once upon a time and it didn't grow back right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is happening in the middle of Leningrad. Like, <laughs> they're just pulling this oh leaky reactor God. out. They're bouncing its humors. And this apparently worked. And two years later, in 1989, the proud SSV-33 Ural of the Soviet Navy was commissioned and it set out on its maiden voyage to Vladivostok in the Far East. So it's being built in the extreme west end of the Soviet Union, and now it has to voyage of the damned its way over to the Pacific Fleet. Does it get a thriving population of chameleons and opiates? Oh no, this thing will kill any animal that comes near it. That's a defense mechanism. What route is it? Like, is it going through the Volga to the Black Sea? What, the, what route is it taking? I'm actually not certain. This is where, like, some of the sourcing for this gets a little... Yeah. The ship thinks very hard, and it just makes a quantum tunnel. Again, we're going to go back to Red Alert, how the allies have, like, the dolphins, right? Oh. Imagine it's, uh, the setting is, you're the dolphin, and you're, your mission is to destroy this ship with your sonic weapon, but it's like, you can't get close without it just murderizing you. Hold that thought. Hold that thought of animals going up against the Ural. What? Did this thing kill a whale? <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. Things did not go well. Like I said, whenever they set out on their maiden voyage, a lot of the Ural systems had never actually been made to work. Everyone just assumed that they would be able to fix them because, hey, the crew is all experts. And it was very important that they did get everything fixed and get the Ural moving because it was being rushed to the Pacific to meet what the Soviets thought was going to be like some new American missile drill. So they were just like, get it going, get it, like, get it there now. Now, <laughs> this event is very fun. 
Um, and things are a little hazy with this. It's corroborated by a couple of sources, but I'm not sure when exactly in the Ural's short career it happened. I believe it happened during the maiden voyage to Vladivostok, or it also may have happened during like a brief cruise south. But regardless, the Ural stopped at a Vietnamese Navy base in Cameron. This was a sort of goodwill visit, which is what, you know, these are normal um, and something that global powers will will do to like show off their new toys, both to their allies and enemies. So the Ural is on its way. It's uh, out and about. It's either on its way to Vladivostok or just on normal patrol. And it stops in Vietnam so that everyone can see how wonderful this new ship is and hopefully not point a Geiger counter at it. Nothing about this ship that we've learned so far is synonymous with goodwill. <laughs> the Vietnamese are like, can we meet the crew of this brave vessel? And like, absolutely not. No, they have been integrated into the vessel. I am. Um, I'm going to save it for the end, but I just had a realization looking at this picture where I've seen this ship before and it's extremely on brand. So please remind me at the end and I will tell you. And to be fair, to an outside observer, the Ural was incredibly impressive. And like NATO, the West, they did not know how much of a shit show this thing was. Everybody outside looking at the ship saw a floating command and control center, a ship that was expected to be the mobile headquarters of the Soviet Pacific Fleet. Like, she was incredibly well decked out. On top of her space tracking equipment, she would have, like, every kind of sensor that could be used to, like, coordinate and command the Soviet Navy in real time, basically. But also, no one got to see how uh, incredibly complicated and finicky all that hardware was. Or the fact that, like, none of it was working at the time. It's a Potemkin is... ship. It's very on brand for the Soviets. Because those systems weren't working, because the supercomputers were not working with the sensors, the Ural was completely useless. Um, she could not do anything approaching her job. But that did not stop the Soviets protecting this ship. Because, like, whether it's working or not, it is a new and advanced ship, and they were worried about spies. They were so worried that the men assigned to guide the Ural didn't just get guns, but they got specialized anti-diver grenade launchers to blast spies and saboteurs out of the water. What? And they, <laughs> in, in Vietnam, one night, the guards spotted a suspicious shape in the water drifting close to the Ural. Immediately deciding that it was a boat full of spies, they bombarded it with grenades. And I am sad to say that this poor sea turtle did not survive. Oh. So they just ran some poor oh. turtles fade because they're sitting there just the <laughs> twitchiest MFs on the planet. Yes, they just see a random turtle and they just blast it to bits. The worst thing to happen to sea turtles since the Dutch. Joe, do you not know that? That like the fucking like the large sea turtle and uh, was like nearly eaten to extinction by the Dutch, like the dodo, which was literally eaten to distinct extinction by the Dutch. It should try not being so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when the Ural made it to its new home in Vladivostok, things did not get better. Uh, the port didn't have a pier big enough to actually dock the ship, so they just decided to anchor it out at sea. The sea, if you don't know, doesn't actually like radomes and sensors and supercomputers. So this kicked off a running battle with corrosion that would plague the Ural for her entire career. Also, because they couldn't rely on power and supplies from the port, like they couldn't run a power cable over, the Ural had to keep her reactors and computers running 24-7. That seems less than ideal. So she's already got a skeleton crew, and now they have to deal with the fact that like there is no downtime. These 200 dudes are going to have to work permanently to keep this ship floating, basically. So what you're saying is, is they have to spend even more time on this ship getting their bones irradiated. So it has to run constantly around the clock while also being completely corroded. So this is in 1989. Over the next three years, the Ural sat at anchor in Vladivostok, slowly corroding in the sea spray as her tiny crew fought to fix half of her equipment while also trying to debug the other half. With no hope of having the Ural actually spy on American drills with broken sensors, the ship stayed in port where it became a floating barracks for officers with dead-end careers. It became a Kuznetsov-style <laughs> punishment boat. <laughs> oh, the punishment boat is such a horrific idea. You get to choose your punishment boat, brackets radiation or brackets mazout. And there, there was also a lot of similarities between them because like the Kuznetsov, it also caught fire a whole bunch of times. Hell yeah. 
Another time, its moorings broke and the pride of the Soviet Navy floated out to sea for a few hours before a tugboat could wrangle it back. It yearns for the ocean. It wants to be free. It's trying to kill itself. Though apparently the Ural did actually survive a near disaster when a nearby ammunition stockpile exploded and basically sent like cruise missiles flying off in a shotgun pattern across Vladivostok. Okay, but a shotgun uh, that fires cruise missiles sounds rad as fuck. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then every single one of them misses the Ural, despite it being in the line of fire. Despite the <laughs> ship wanting to die. Someone's like all of these crew, like everyone standing on the deck, raising their like dozens of arms to the sky and wailing <laughs> for death as every cruise missile just like dodges around it. Every single crewman looks like fucking Goro from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> Please let it end. You tune the radio frequencies just right. And you can hear the ship screaming, kill me. Guy, guy trying to get off the Ural by shooting himself in the foot, but he only has the grenade launcher. <laughs> no, he, and then he's like, no, I don't have enough bullets to shoot my other six feet. <laughs> yeah, he's turned into a centaur from Fallout. <laughs> Rotting at anchor. So in 1992, after three years at anchor and never having actually sailed on a mission, uh, the Ural's reactors were shut down, and she was placed on a far-off pier next to her sister ship, the nuclear battle uh, cruiser Frunze. Still, she was listed as an active ship of the new Russian Navy, and they used her the same way the Soviets had, as a floating prison for the worst sailors in the Navy. Alright. At least they finally found something it's good at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this also has the problem that because this has been designated as like a punishment ship, the crew is getting stupider and stupider. As, like, as the maintenance needs are going up, the crew's ineptitude is also going up. So she just spends the next decade fully rotting at anchor. She never puts to sea again, her radars and sensors were never fixed, and most of them were never made to work in the first place. Like, they weren't broken, <laughs> they had just never... You, you can't break something that hasn't been... that wasn't working before. The radar was never actually there, it was sold off during the production. <laughs> It's more Hold impressive that, that they managed to do all of this damage with this leaking ship that's constantly pumping out radiation and never actually worked in the first place. It's really spectacular if you think about it. <laughs> so another problem is that because of ridiculously high running costs, the Russian Navy couldn't have got this thing going even if they wanted to. She was officially decommissioned in 2002 and... That was the end of her official career, but the SSV-33 Ural would die a slow and humiliating death. Sometime between 2002 and 2008, a storm blew through the port and ripped the ship's massive radome bubble apart. Like, it got damaged first, which allowed water in, and like corroded the radar, and then eventually it just like, a storm just picked up the entire dome and just took it. Yeah, Mother Nature just performed a Mortal Kombat finisher on it, just ripped its head off. <laughs> Fatality. Which exposed the very valuable radar and then like flies to shit. It was the Ural was immediately invaded by scavengers who just like picked all of the sensors apart. Oh, it's a Tarkov yeah. map too. <laughs> We're doing stalker shit on the mobile Chernobyl. We're trying to find the zone that's in trying the to middle find of the, the radar. Wish granter in the Ural. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to not be on the Ural anymore. <laughs> that's everyone just has to say fucking wish when they get to the zone. <laughs> Let me the fuck off this boat. Also, because she had drifted away one time, to prevent that happening, she was welded to her pier. They just took, like, huge chunks of steel and just, like, physically bolted the Ural to prevent it getting away. They're, they're preventing someone to steal it. Is it like, oh man, scrappers are gonna come and take this shit? <laughs> also, at some point, she developed, like, a list, like a five-degree tilt to one side because of flooding. Yes! Quinn, I know that you had specifically mentioned the Wish Granter, but I'm now just imagining like that glowing vestige of the reactor that's just <laughs> remaining is, yeah, it's just like, come to me, I will grant you what you deserve. The, re the reactor is still in the ship at this point. Oh my god. The reactor has been shut down, but it is still fueled. That's what, I, that's is... what I'm saying. Like, you, you simply do not just, it, it's like, it's like. You know, like a bajillion guys die on a battlefield that becomes haunted, right? Like you, you remove everything that was there. It's still haunted, right? Like how many bombs and souls has this thing consumed, right? Like it's cursed. It's just this there. Is why, this is why Tarkovsky is like the single greatest Russian artist ever, because no one has like so accurately captured Russia vibes than he did in any of his movies. <laughs> like, 
the entire journey of this ship is just like a Tarkovsky movie. And it is sufficiently damp as well. Yeah. Disposal work was started in 2008, but then even that was delayed because of a lack of funds. By 2016, most of the ship's superstructure and sensors had been dismantled, and then they would have to kind of like figure out a way to get the reactor out of there. And it wouldn't be until 2018 that the SSV Ural was fully taken apart. What an effort that would have been. I, yeah. <laughs> you signed up to just like cut a ship into pieces. You did not sign up to fight the flesh beasts. Y yeah. You know, that, that's going to be a couple extra rubles right there. Those camel spiders throw mean hands. <laughs> they're, they're wearing six or three pairs of small boxing gloves <laughs> the hardest part about cutting through this boat would have been scraping off all of the discarded flesh that had been left behind we have seen the nuclear god we have decided to discard our flesh prisons your your one escape like your way to ascend Everybody just lies on top of the radome and then it is cranked up to max at the same time and all of your constituent atoms are sent to space. You're just made to soup. So that, everyone, is the story of the SSV-33 Ural, the world's largest spy ship that never actually did any spying and constantly leaked radiation. How's everyone feeling? <laughs> I mean, like, a couple of, if this had survived a couple of years later... You know full well Putin would have tried to send it to the Crimean Sea. Oh, God. 100%. <laughs> we Just dare as... you to hit it with a fucking missile. We dare you. This is an ocean denial weapon. Just it being in the sea means that, yeah, no one can get near it. All shipping has to stop and no one can eat seafood anymore. Yeah, do you want, mm. you want to poison your ocean? We'll do it. <laughs> Quinn, how do I feel this has just been a journey of unprecedented suffering? I know. It's another wonderful storied tale of the Russian Navy, Soviet and Russian Navy. It's just like it's a lemony snicket for Russian sni Russian sailors. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious which led to more direct and indirect deaths, this or the Kuznetsov. Uh, uh, and uh, an arithmetic we will never know. I mean, I'm willing to bet the Kuznetsov just because like all, all jokes aside, I don't think the Ural was actually like murdering the people on it. Um, it was just like a very unhealthy place, whereas we know that Kuznetsov is like routinely killing people with fires or getting its back broken with a crane. I, I do like that recently Russia had to say that they um, foiled a plot by the Ukrainian intelligence of destroying the Kuznetsov in dock. Is like, I don't think they have to do that. Can you destroy a scrapyard? Is that physically possible? I think it would behoove the Ukrainians to not do anything to the Kuznetsov because it's tying up valuable Just resources. Just enough of a liability? That's like arguing that someone sent your dumpster fire on fire. But like this ship, it, it mightn't have killed anyone directly, but like, much like the seminal novel by Stanislav's Lem, Solaris, it is the, the, the being, the soul of the ship is murdering people. <laughs> oh, this is a specter that haunts Vladivostok still. <laughs> I mean, listen, there's a lot of fucking specters that haunt Vladivostok. <laughs> Just one more for the army. This whole place is lousy fucking specters, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, like, uh, have you been haunted? Okay, this visitation that you have. Uh, is this a spiritual haunting or is this a nuclear haunting? We deal with both of those. One of them is going to be a little more expensive. I'm a nuclear exorcist. The spiritual <laughs> harpoon anti-ship missile. Drink this lead. It won't bother you again. I've become atomic at Captain Ahab. <laughs> Throwing a giant harpoon right in the radome. Okay, I did, I did want to come back to that, Tom. You mentioned that you had seen this thing in anime somewhere, and I'm now very curious. <laughs> it's got to be Ava, right? This is very funnily in uh, the second Ava reboot. Re I fucking knew mobile, it was Ava! <laughs> mobile command center. I think it was also in the World War Z book. They use the Ural as the international headquarters of the human <laughs> resistance against the zombies, which would not have worked. This is not a good... Because they're trying to wipe out the rest of humanity. Yes. <laughs> the nihilist faction using the boat that will kill you immediately. <laughs> So, everybody, thank you for uh, hearing me talk about a very stupid boat. Joe and Tom, thank you so much for coming on uh, Failure to Launch. Do you guys want to plug your shows? Yeah, uh, we are the hosts of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. Where we talk about military history, disasters, blunders, all throughout every period of history. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm terrorism correspondent for Lions Led by Donkeys, and uh, I do a 
show about the history of tattooing called Beneath the Skin, and I'm the producer of a comedy podcast called Glue Factory, where it's literally no theme, the cameras roll, and then just w- whatever someone throws on the table is just riffing for an hour and a half. Well, yeah, thank you guys for coming on. And listener, thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to hear more of this, if you want to hear us review Solaris, the movie that Tom mentioned, if you sign up at any tier, you get access to a monthly bonus episode. If you sign up at any elevated tiers, you get access to further bonus uh, mini sewed content. Everyone, thank you for listening. Tom and Joe, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It was a great time learning about another dumb boat and the annals of dumb boats. Mm-hmm. And listener, goodbye. Goodbye, listener. Adios. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons. Our cyborg cats are Boss, Charlie, Ellie M, Jorg2, send me rocket email, June, Lupe C, Matt, Spectre Cohen, and Tortilla Baron. Our space dogs are a Union Thug, Angry Old Man, yada yada, Van User, Ben L, Boomzilla, Brandon M, Chainsaw Snuggling, Captain Lag, Daddy Bongo, Dan A, Double Time, Fractal Moonlight, Furious Luddite, James A, James C, Joe, John C, Lane of the Wired, Lenswipe, Nick S, Oliver, Sean H, Sensual Kazoo, Sean P, Sparks, Tom M, Trash Do, Barosh T, Will W, Wingsmith, and Zim. Albert Count, 56. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. FTL intro and outro themes were provided by DJ Danarchy.